Welcome back, everyone, to the Cube SuperCloud 6. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante here in our Palo Alto studios live for a presentation. All day, we're going to talk about the AI innovators. We've got two great uh, startups here. We've got Venkat, the CEO of Rockset, and Kyle, head of product at OneHouse.ai. Building AI apps in the cloud scale. Guys, great to see you, Venkat. Good to see you. Great to come in. Hey, guys. Thanks, Thanks, for, having in. Thanks for having us. Thanks I, for having us. You guys are um, uh, a startup that's growing rapidly, both your companies, uh, but you're on the growth curve and you're in the middle of what I call the perfect storm. So if you're not on the right side of this wave, you're either going to be driftwood or miss the wave. That's so right. you guys are in good position. We've had you both on theCUBE before. Um, but the big conversation is, okay, as startups, you guys got to get that next round of funding, okay, which is going to come down to the success. And given that you're in the hottest area, yes. both of you guys are, um, data is the number one thing people are talking about with Gen AI. Bad data is bad Gen AI. Then the next question is, what infrastructure am I going to run it on? Yes. But that's not about a server or cloud, that's a collection of stuff or a system. So these guys, are, this is the hottest area. Yes. So I want to get your perspective, one, as an innovator, how do you guys see the current market relative to how people are keeping up with the, with the trends? Venka, we'll start with you. For sure. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, and uh, in terms of what's happening, the Gen AI applications, LLM based applications, created a new category of applications that require a different data architecture, right? You can't use the traditional databases and traditional backends to try and build and innovate in this space. And now I think the next wave of um, uh, you know, applications that are being developed is that every application is getting enhanced with AI. So it's not just that there is a new category of applications like chatbots and other things that are being created, but every application now is getting enhanced with AI. And so the demands on the data architecture that allows people to build these AI applications quickly and efficiently at scale is, is the most important need of the hour. And that's exactly what we're doing at Rockset. As a search analytics database, uh, we power applications, mm -hmm. you know, we have, uh, you know, that needs to be modern and that, that needs to be you know, a, in a, in, you know, with, a, enhanced with AI. And so that's what we do. I think um, you know, we have um, you know, customers like JetBlue building Gen AI applications on Rockset. We can talk about those kinds of use cases. But, um, but yeah, I think the, it's, it's a really, really, really important to continue to innovate in the space yeah. that the data architectures are enhanced with you know, ability to store vector embeddings, ability to index vector embeddings, and so that you can extract value from both your structured and unstructured data. I know you guys are doing a lot in your product. I want to come back to that, but Kyle, I want to get you in here on this one question because yeah. like, you guys are both doing things that aren't categorically what other people used to do. Yeah. It's like, hey, they do observability. Mm -hmm. They do a database. They do that, those were categorical, maybe they're magic quadrants or whatever, but now we're in a world where the, th the needs are different. You need to be multiple things. So these new categorical formations are starting to happen. I noticed that both you guys both have that same dynamic. Can you explain what's happening and, yeah. and why it's happening? Yeah, the wind is at our back, like you mentioned and teeing this up, we're building the businesses in that uh, right space right now where there's a lot of urgency and a lot of demand. Everyone's trying to build uh, uh, better data structures and data structures and systems, as you mentioned, that can uh, be ready for building AI applications and generative AI. And what we're uh, building at one house today is what we call the universal data lake house, something that can unify data from all of your variety of sources, whether these are event streams and you need to bring in real time data into your system, or whether these are uh, transactional databases that you have on a uh, line of business applications and you need to bring in change data capture or even just pull out any of the data that's inside of your uh, swamp of a data lake. And, and add structure to this data, governance to this data, performance optimization so it's analytics ready and ready to um, you know, train your ML models, uh, build and create the vector embeddings and store these in any downstream system that you need and, and, and leverage any tool that's out there uh, to then go so, uh, build So back. the big innovation in the so-called modern data platform of let's call it you know, 2015 to today was the separation of compute and storage right. and the cloud scale. We, we know that well, a lot of money came in. Right. Obviously Snowflake and Databricks, you know, got escape velocity and the hyperscalers obviously play there. So I'm curious as to how you see the next generation platform. We call it the six data platform. That's We're kind right. of playing around with names, right. uh, but it's very different. It, it, it's powering intelligent apps, Correct. much more real time. That's why we love having Uber in because it's like real time people, places and things. As well, it's unifying all the different data sources. Now, of course, you've got existing data platforms trying to get there. How do you guys see this playing out? Maybe Venkat from the sort of intelligent apps perspective, and Kyle, maybe from the 
What is that, that, that future data store? What does that yeah. look like? I think if you look at the, these modern AI applications, the, the data architecture largely has two really, really important sides to it. There's this one side where you're training, you're either building new models or you are enhancing, you know, fine tuning existing models with your own data sets, which is your you know, proprietary data that, mm -hmm. that is helping you fine tune and build these models better. And um, so there's this whole infrastructure around how do you, you know, aggregate all this data and how do you use it to build really, really efficient models that um, you know, helps you build products that, that are you know, enhanced by AI. And or you're taking other open source models and you're fine tuning it with your data sets. And then there's the inference side, which is when you take those models and you get extract you know, embeddings out of that and you still need a serving tier and to build applications on top of. And so both of these things need to get enhanced so that you can have these very fast iterative cycles. And the other really important component that wires across this entire stack is real time. Right. And so AI applications, there's very few AI applications that can work in batch mode. And I'll give you an example. Let's, let's say you want to build a song recommendation. If you just, you know, based on the song that is being listened, if you just kind of make, recommend another song that is closest to it in terms of vector space, that's not actually going to be a very good recommendation engine because you might have heard, just heard that song five minutes ago. So that's a very bad recommendation for that individual user. So you have to incorporate behavioral data, you have to incorporate real-time data in order to make these products really, really you know, effective. Just, just real quick on that one point, because I think this is really nuanced, but it's important. The vectors are important for identifying context. Correct. What you're saying is a new kind of data set needs to be behavioral. Yes. In, in vector form or other form? No, it's usually in a metadata, it's usually called metadata filtering uh, in, in the AI kind of parlance. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important to combine traditional data sets and, and real-time state that you have about what is happening you know, uh, with the listening history and other things in this particular example, and you have to incorporate that alongside the vector embeddings and vector search to build contextualized, you know, personalized kind of recommendation engines and, and, and So this like is that. a unique use case that's situational based upon the Gen AI movement yes. that's, that ML and Gen AI have pulled out, which is the new holy grail contextual and behavioral exactly. accuracy exactly. and personalization. And for that, you need real time, and whether it is uh, on, the, on the Lake House side, what uh, Onehausen and Apache Hudi allows you uh, to, to kind of build your entire data architecture on the training side, on, on being able to accumulate all of that in real time, or on the serving side, you really need a unified search and retrieval system which is what Rockset is. So, uh, so Snowflake would say, put it all into Snowflake. Yeah. And, and you know, they're going to do fine with that. They bring AI to all that. Sure. Snowflake, but we know the but. The but is <laughs> hard to get transaction data. We can't get Unistore. Sure. So, okay, so last June, I guess, we saw Databricks with Unity Catalog and said, oh, we'll bring anybody's data in. Okay, that's cool. And then Amazon, you got metadata and glue, you got metadata in, in data zones, and it's sort of all over the place, but they'll figure that out. So is that the problem you're solving? How do you, how do you see the world differently? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that you know, with the uh, rise of AI and, and new tools are coming out every week, every month, you probably see new open source projects uh, starting up. And uh, customers need uh, interoperability and choice. I think I even read some of the research that you guys published from ETR that uh, showed that 40 to 50% of accounts that use either Databricks or Snowflake are using both. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and totally. now uh, a, a new trend that uh, you've seen also from Snowflake, right? They're supporting um, open uh, uh, table formats such as Iceberg, Iceberg right? Yeah. On, the, on the Data Lake side. And uh, Databricks, of course, uh, Delta Lake uh, was created there. Now there's a third one also that's been around since 2016 that came out of uh, Uber. Um, and, and that's where the origin story for One House is as well. It's called Apache Hoodie. And so right now customers are in kind of a, a tricky situation where if they are using Databricks, Databricks wants them to use Delta Lake. If they're using Snowflake, Snowflake wants them to use Iceberg. So we also uh, just recently uh, launched a new open source project. We co-launched this with Microsoft and Google and it's called Xtable, Apache Xtable. It's incubating into the Apache Software Foundation right now. And so this is a, a fresh news, hot off the press, uh, just put out the... the is Elon involved? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Xtable stands for cross table. And, and no, its purpose is to, to enable seamless interoperability <laughs> between the, yeah. yes, yes. All right, so what's the impact? What's the, what is that going to enable? What is Xtable's yes. going to enable? Yes. What's the impact? So now you no longer have to spend months. I've seen organizations spend months and months of uh, analysis and they get trapped in analysis paralysis of which table format should I choose and which one. But each of these communities 
there's, there's purpose behind these communities. They're all three great projects, and they all have special features behind them. And so now people are like, hey, do I need something that's closer to near real time and has a, a faster ingestion capabilities like Apache Hootie? Or do I need something that has a really great um, a specification of the format like Iceberg? Or do I need something that works incredibly well with Databricks like Delta Lake? Yeah. And now they're kind of trapped in this, this decision-making process that's very hard to, to come to. Yeah, and I, 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 I want to explain. I mean, our view is we're moving from a world that is very application-centric to one that's data-centric. And yeah. in doing that, you've got metadata that's locked inside of yeah. all these application yes. silos. Yes. And that's the problem that you're trying to that's solve right. because that's right. applying AI to that. And then when you get to the point of systems of agency taking action, yes. you can't yes. do that unless you have a unified right. data that's source. Right. And, and like you called out, like there was the great innovation of decoupling compute from storage, right? And the, the rise of Snowflake and, and these other tools uh, uh, similar. And now it's a time, like you guys have talked about this uh, sixth uh, uh, data, platform. data platform, right? It's, now is the time to decouple data from storage and, and from yeah. all of these computers. Everyone wants to build a vertical optimized stack. Yeah, we call it <clears throat> separating compute from storage and moving to separating compute from data. Yes, yes. So yes, all data sources are yeah. then available to any compute yes. and we're not quite there yet, but because it feels like there's a lot of missing gaps. Yes. You guys are trying to fill those gaps, That's right. obviously. That's right. So. Yeah, so the data ops is, so, so again, back to this point, if you believe that unified data or separating data from uh, storage is going to happen, which we do, then you look at generative AI to your point, and what you're saying is that real-time information, exactly. data addressability has to have low latency yeah. uh, uh, availability. Exactly. Highly available and high availability at the same time. That's not like the way it was. It yes. used to be very slow, and you call a database, you get stuff. Now, to make data freely available, it also has risks. Yes. You got security risks, you got exposed data, so sure. you got to have all that governance kind of built in from day one. This is disrupting the market because all the data applications were stovepiped. Mm. Okay, now if you take the, take the silos away and take the stovepipes away and make it horizontally available, then you start thinking about, okay, what does that mean for the categories like observability? What about things like data? What's working with context? If I have vectors, if I'm generating answers, is there memory? Is what's good? How do I observe that? So every category of these big markets are inadequate. Yes, I think the models, the autoregressive LLMs, I think are, are doing a phenomenal job at, uh, you know, with enhancing, with enhancements like RAG, right? Like one way you're infusing context is, you know, you turn a prompt into a similarity search, you, you, you know, retrieve relevant results, you add it to the prompt, even though the user didn't actually specify it, and using that, the LLM is able to spit out uh, a, a collection of words that happens to be actually quite accurate in a, in a quite a, you know, number of situations. But again, if you think about an airline, major airline building a chatbot, what are people asking questions about? Real-time flight information, right? Take any, any particular Gen AI application, recommendation engines, you know, anomaly detectors, you know, is this anomaly new? You know, is this happening now? Why does it matter? Uh, so in any part, in any application that is sophisticated and is actually going to have real-world impact, but getting, getting enhanced with AI, Real time has to be part of the answer. Yeah. Yes. Otherwise, it's you know. Otherwise, it's a library, you know, that can give you static information about you know, you know, some book that was written or something like that. Um, so it's 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 able to kind of summarize that for you. But if you really have to put that to production and, and actually have build better products, enhancing you know, enhance with the AI and all these things. This is the, why yeah. this is why we use the, uh, the the metaphor of Uber for all. You've got. Real time I riders, drivers, people, places, and things, routes, trans, you know, yeah. transaction data. You've got, got an application, you, you, and you've got you know, prices and ETAs and the like. And those are all different data elements. You're bringing that together in real time, and now they have you know, thousands of engineers building this stuff. But for Uber, to, to, for any organization to be able to build that, they need some kind of horizontal layer. So how do you deal with transactions? That's the yeah. hard part. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and uh, transactions and coming from, the, there's a tricky art of trying to stitch your data across transactional systems, operational systems, and analytical systems, right? And uh, change data capture has been around for a long time. Um, but when you try to bring this into data lakes and object storage, things like S3, um, that's when it gets even harder. And that's why uh, uh, some of these projects were, were born. This is where, if you read back in the origin story from Uber itself, um, they were trying to bring transactions to a data lake and object storage right. Hadoop at yeah. the time. 
um, and that's where um, there were Apache Hootie was born. And, and certain metadata layers were, were built around this yeah. to, to enable you to mutate data on otherwise immutable data inside object yeah. storage. So once you can bring systems from transactional databases and systems from uh, like, like OLTP systems, now you can uh, uh, have these in lakes where you can bring the best of the tools to the table, yeah. whether these are things like Databricks or uh, with Apache Spark or Apache Flink, yeah. Presto, Trino, you name it, bring it to the table. You can create your vector embeddings from there, uh, then serve these down into either vector databases or combined uh, uh, with uh, search capabilities like Rockset. Um, and, and stitch this all together through your uh, data architecture. Well, you guys both are doing great work as innovators and we appreciate you coming on theCUBE. We have a few minutes left. Um, and it's also, it's also hard for startups that are like in your category where you're doing things that don't look like it was before. Mm -hmm. And so um, as Andy Jassy used to say in the early, early days of AWS on theCUBE is, you have to be misunderstood for a little while before people get it. And now people have started to get it. So. Um, Last couple of minutes we have, I want each of you guys to talk to the, the, the cameras in the audience from my perspective of, I'm a customer and I'm an investor because you guys are doing a round of funding soon, probably got tons of term sheets. What's the vision? Why sh what should be the customers be thinking about your company? Why do you exist? What's the main thing that you do that's different than what people might think you do? And then if you're I'm an investor, what's the pitch deck look like? What's the summary? I can go first. Um, Roxit is a search and analytics database built for the cloud. And if you want to build uh, Gen AI applications, you want, you, you know, uh, what customers are looking for is not one vector database over here, one another database for traditional search, and then another completely different one, different system for real time analytics. Uh, we are a single database that can do unified search and retrieval, and we are built for powering end user customer facing applications. And so you can build very very powerful applications, and we're entirely built for the cloud. And so build your applications faster, extremely you know, quick time to market, and scaling efficiently in the cloud. And so we have a massive number of innovations we can index uh, in real time with you know, sub 100 millisecond kind of response times and data latencies. You can build very, very powerful applications and scale them efficiently in the cloud. That is what we do. Um, and so Rockset um, you know, wants to unify, you know, uh, you know, unifies all of your data sets across traditional search, vector search, and real-time analytics so that you can build these powerful applications and all simply using SQL. Real quick follow up there. Why is vector search important now? I mean, it's been around for a while, but in context of the retrieval augmentation generation or RAG as they call it, why is it important? Why are people paying so much attention to this? And why is it important for an enterprise? Yes, I think, I think uh, that is the best way uh, for you to enhance, leverage all the innovations happening in AI. I'll give you a very simple example. If you're trying to do keyword search in your application, if somebody wants to types cold beverage, you also want to suggest iced coffee. It doesn't have the word cold or beverage in it. And that is the kind of uh, you know, enhancement your application can have when uh, you can enhance your search applications with vector search. And so this is what I, you know, uh, you know our, 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 our thesis is that it, AI applications are not a new category of applications that sit by the side while traditional applications keep going. Yeah. Every application that you're going to be using in, in your daily basis are going to get enhanced in AI and you're not even going to notice it because you're just going to take it for granted when I search for cold beverage, iced coffee should show up, otherwise you just won't use that application. Because the keyword match doesn't linguistically match Correct. by the language, but the vector calculates it differently. Correct. Okay, great. Correct. Kyle, you're up. Um, yeah. Customer and investor, start with the customer. What, what do you guys yeah. do that's different and important and uh, what's the pitch deck? Yeah, alongside with the customer, I'll share a, a quick story as well, but also a question for, for you. Do you see, um, uh, as companies and organizations go to build uh, out and innovate around AI, you probably see pocketbooks open, right? In contrast to where general market trends are of a hey, budget's tightening and things like this, I think any organization I've talked to, there's still great budget for um, building and innovating around AI. Yes, like, and we talked about AI. that earlier. We showed yeah. some data yeah. great. that, that okay. showed that. And it's stealing from other budgets, actually. Great. Yeah, and, but they, they got to see proof points. Yeah. They, they got to see they proof points, They want to see instant yes. ROI. But also in this new emerging um, um, domain, there's also um, baselines that haven't been set yet. And as companies go to build these, they're, they're very quick to building architectures that will work for um, like a, a quick applications and, and um, quick innovations as they're, as they're uh, uh, building these new platforms. Um, but now as the industry starts to mature, 
and um, your, your data systems start to scale, you'll see opportunities where people will be pulling um, back from specific single databases and vector databases um, back to systems that can scale around uh, data lakes. Um, and so I'll, I'll share a quick story. There was a, a organization, I even wrote this up uh, uh, recently, um, uh, where they were um, uh, trying to generate their vector embeddings um, from uh, images and other um, uh, text uh, inputs. And it was uh, taking a very long time to get it done. And they're running at data lake scale, which typically is like 100x where you sit from data warehouses or, or otherwise. And um, so they, uh, they modified this from using specific single tools, brought this to uh, uh, data lakes where they could create the embeddings, but then put the embeddings in the purpose-built system uh, to run the vector search. Um, and once they did this, they were able to get tremendous cost savings and time to vector embedding creation. And then they could put it in the appropriate system for the vector search and really fast analytics on top. And so to round that back from like one specific customer story, um, if you are aiming to build a data lake or a data lake house, one house is the fastest and easiest way to get it done. Um, point and click. Uh, very simple to pull in all of your data from the variety of sources and not just bring it in, but now your data can be performance optimized and we take care of all of the specialized like database and data warehouse functionality, indexes, clustering, the things you take for granted in a normal database or data warehouse. We bring these to the lake and make it seamless for you to have all of your data analytics. What about traction? Where's the traction point you guys seeing right yeah. now? Yeah, Trax traction is great. We see from all sides of the market people want to build these data systems and structures yeah. and they're eager and they're like uh, really pushing to get into um, these areas, whether it's coming from cost reduction or whether it's so coming see from a, innovation. You, you see customer adoption yes, on your yes, side. Yes. Ben Kat, where's your traction point? On uh, hundreds of customers in production, you know, from large enterprises to a 10 person startup. Okay. Um, we have, you know, customers like JetBlue, yeah. customers like Klarna, uh, building anomaly detectors yeah. and, and Gen AI applications on Rockset, yeah. and they all want to scale. Yeah. And I, coming back to what, one thing you mentioned, which is uh, they have to see the ROI. So a lot of the AI applications are migrating away from the tinkering phase to I got to run it in production. Yeah. Okay, show me the ROI, what yeah. is it? And where do I run it? Yes. Where do I host it? Do I and host it in a clustered on-premise or in cloud or you know, it's cloud well, operation? Exactly, and Klarna is a customer and they published these results that they have had where, by adopting Gen AI um, you know, in the last uh, week or so, where they have, you know, replaced the work of, you know, 400 plus uh, support agents and, and are able to do that, you know, Gen AI agents are able to do that at a fraction of the cost. But and it, so that's the kind of ROI you need. And the other really important point you made is this is not like a separate workload that's as off on the side. 100% of workloads are going to be intelligent AI infused. Yes. Yes. And that is, that is quite different than what we've seen in the past. Well, we got, we got a little bit over time, but I, since you're here, it's the great R&D and good, good research for us too. Quick question for both of you. Is there a new persona emerging that's handling all this? Mm. Because it's not the observability team, it's not the cloud native team, although there may be a collection. Is there a new, it's not IT racking and stacking, is there a new persona I think in organizations that are handling all this? What I'm seeing is that the research uh, you know, department, you know, traditional data scientists uh, are, really now being challenged to try and bring the right models and fine tune the right models with proprietary data sets that every enterprise have so that the AI can do what that business needs as opposed to being very generic LLMs. Uh, that Are they new teams forming? Are they pre-existing security teams? Are they platform engineering teams? I mean, is, is the DevOps I mainly think, DevOps teams? Or? I think it's too early to say. I think everyone is challenged to try and uh, adopt yeah. this because it's in a, you know, yeah. the things are moving very fast and evolving very quickly. Yeah. But I think every function from, you know, analysis to data science yeah. to architecture. It's a know, new IT, it's a new, it's a new thing. Yes. Well, compared you, to like traditional think? software engineering, yeah. the tools and systems are still pretty immature for data and data engineering. Yeah. But as we mature these tools and, and systems around data engineering, yeah. Uh, the, the, I think there's slightly a new role that I hear talked about uh, of uh, analytics engineer and someone that is, has uh, yeah. wicked good chops on SQL and other things. But now, 
as data tools and systems have become easier yeah. and more accessible, now they can also provide those roles that were typically- It's the perfect storm. You got the cloud native scale folks who know horizontal scalability, and then you get the, and also know data engineering, SRE types and DevOps, DevSecOps. Then you got the analytics that have been handling the crown jewels yes. where the data value is yeah. coming together, which by the way, was not the motion we've seen in the past. Those were protected, highly protected, data science driven. Hyper specialized. Yeah. Do you see that consolidate? I mean, I know there are teams of you know, 30, 40, 50 people in the data pipeline, data engineers, quality engineers, business analysts, <clears throat> they all have their own little <laughs> sort of job to do and nothing can happen until that's done. It's a very linear sequential process. Mm -hmm. How do you see that? changing, will that collapse, will AI, how do you see AI affecting that? Any thoughts on that? I think the data stack, as it enhances AI, uh, you know, some of these things would get automated away, right? I think it's, you, you can now look at the data and summarize it without really going into the deep and, and, and pre-processing it. I think the way uh, people are interacting with the data with these visualization tools and SQL-based uh, analytics, I think is going to get appended with prompt engineering, you know, like mm -hmm. you should be able to yeah. just, uh, you know, talk to your, what's happening with my business, where do you really need an army of data analysts yeah. for a CXX to ask some very important questions about the data and interrogate the data? So I think the whole data architecture I'm saying is evolving very, very quickly. It'll set the table. It's going to set the agenda. We, we totally agree. Yes. Dave, a CGAI is emerging, a chief generative AI officer. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Well, guys, thanks for coming. Venkat, great to uh -huh. see you. Thanks for having Kyle, us. Guys, thanks, thanks for guys. contributing uh, this great conversation here on SuperCloud 6. You guys are both AI innovators and uh, good luck on your next round. I'm sure you got term Thank sheets you. flying at you right away. Thank you. So. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Cube in there for a little round, Cube Capital. Cube. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't started that yet. We're working on it. Thank you so All right. much. Thanks for coming on. Okay, we'll be right back with SuperCloud 6 AI innovators after this short break. Stay with us.